we are two former Zionists who clearly fell from grace. Now, don't be deceived by my accent. I actually was born and raised in Israel. And if you want proof of that, I can change my accent so that you will believe me when I say I am from Israel. <laughs> One of the reasons that we wrote this book is maybe because we feel connected to that part of the world, to the Israel that we grew up in, and would like very much to see it stop self-destructing and taking along with it a lot of collateral damage. Both of us were once dedicated Zionists, and we believed wholeheartedly that Zionism was the national liberation movement of the Jewish people. We believed in the right of the Jewish people to national self-determination and a historic right to their homeland. We were both products of an education system that taught us that Israel was really an empty land of no people, for a people, without a land. This was the slogan of our youth. Arab Palestinians living in Israel had no such rights because they were newcomers to the area. This is what we were taught. They were the newcomers to the area. And they drifted in from other Arab countries to which they should all go back. And they came in to reap the benefits of the productivity of the Zionists who risked their lives to drain the swamps, irrigate the deserts, and do other ecologically wise things, and make the land livable. We believe that no other people in history suffered as much as the Jews, and therefore the world owed them a country, and they deserved everything the world would give them. At different times and without knowing each other, we both attended the same nationalistic youth movement, and we both patriotically served in the army. And another uh, personal note, I outranked him. We understood that although we lived in the only democracy in the Middle East, we could never criticize our government, much less our army, because that did two things. It endangered the security of our country and our homeland, and it endangered us. But there were many inconsistencies that both of us couldn't really live with, and gradually they became unacceptable. There was a never-ending, throughout my lifetime, a never-ending process to peace, and along the way there were persistent atrocities that achieved nothing but symbolic handshaking, and a never-ending spiral of retaliation which only seemed to accelerate. The 1967 war, which is pivotal, placed Israel in command of all of mandatory Palestine, the Sinai Peninsula, and the Golan Heights. At that time, I was a soldier, and along with the rest of the country, celebrated the Israeli victory in a state of euphoria. Finally, the David beat Goliath. And I knew with the certainty of a 20-year-old, so that tells you how old I am, that now Israel would negotiate in good faith from a position of power and would end the spiral of hostilities and bloodshed. But for a long time after that victory, all we would hear in Israeli broadcasts on the radio were competing schemes to hold on to territory, talks about annexing the West Bank and Gaza, and morally repugnant talks of transfer. And the settlements began in the occupied territories, and these settlements established facts on the ground and spit in the face of any possible reconciliation. I was a Tel Aviv University student when Nasser invited someone named Nahum Goldman, who was the head of the World Jewish Congress, to come to Cairo, this was 1970, to discuss peace. This was just after the war of attrition in Israel, in, in the Middle East, had commenced, and I joined other equally enthusiastic students to hand out and distribute pamphlets to all Israelis and to go demonstrate on Golda Meir's lawn. And for our efforts, we were rewarded with a blue dye sprayed onto us so that we could be recognized as we walked down the street. Of course, years later when we demonstrated, it was tear gas. So I guess I preferred the blue dye. What, there were many incidents, like we, we mentioned in the book, a lot of the people that we had, we had as heroes who were actually seeking peace and for their efforts 
were put in jail. One of them was Amy Natton. I don't know how many of you know him, but we refer to him in the book. War has lasted in Israel as long as the state, and, and Israel without war appears increasingly inconceivable to those who spend the better part of their lives anticipating or performing in battle. Most of Israel's most trusted leaders, certainly until the past maybe decade, were, were directly from the military. The cynic might ask, God forbid, what do soldiers do when there's no war? And I'm an economist, so I would just like to say that Israel's economy is fundamentally tied to the military industry with maybe 7 to 8 percent of its GDP, but it leads the world in per capita defense spending, and I won't go into an economics lecture here. But army generals, as army generals, are prone to respond to something like a 13-year-old's throwing stones with increased hostility, uh, maybe more hostility. And the question is, how are occupied people supposed to protest? They don't have an army, and they don't have weapons. Maybe they have stones. If the Palestinians remain silent in an oppression, in an occupation, which they never wanted, if they remain silent, then Israel will say, well, they're happy, they're fine. You don't hear them complaining, well, they're silent. But if they protest, they all become terrorists. So retaliation becomes a never-ending spiral. Um, for as long as Israel exists, and at least for as long as I've been alive, the Arab has been demonized. And this justifies the fact that Israel can build settlement, can restrict water supply, can confiscate Arab land, can impose curfews, and yet it's the Arab who threatens us. They don't have an army in Palestine. Any action, retaliatory or preemptive, taken by the military is perceived or um, proclaimed to be self-defense. So it's an ongoing cycle. The generals and many of Israel's leaders know this, and they want to perpetuate the fear of the Arabs so that they can keep and hold on to power, because that's what they do. One of Israel's greatest heroes, greatest military heroes, became prime minister in 1992. It was the second time he became prime minister. And he actually seemed as if he might be interested in peace. He even convinced and inspired people from his own country and the world that he was serious. And this, of course, is Yitzhak Rabin. Support for Rabin inside Israel was very enthusiastic and keen, except for those who detested his betrayal of Israel's true mission, about which Salman will explain. I was there when he was assassinated, and it was I was in the same square with Rabin, not a hundred meters away from him. And I didn't see the assassination, but I heard about it five minutes later as I was driving in my car away from the place where we stood. Who was he assassinated by? He was assassinated by a messianic, right-wing, settler fanatic. The the, the number of settlers in Israel today, it wasn't that big a deal then because for some reason that seemed to inspire more settlements to come into Israel. But many of the settlers today, if you hear them on the television or the radio, speak English beautifully because most of them came from the United States, a lot of them from New York. Recently, I think it was about eight months ago, a, a religious man, uh, a minister in one of the uh, splinter, one of the major, what's the word I want to use? It's not a splinter, it's the, the swing, uh, swing party, a party that will affect whether Bibi can hold on to power, um, declared that Israel must build a thousand new units in settlements for every Jew that's killed in terrorist attacks. <coughs> So what we see in Israel and what we've been seeing in Israel is a, pro, uh, a, a constant shift to the right. If you look at the Israeli political 
uh, makeup today, there is no left. There is no left. There is no Labor Party. The Labor Party has been disseminated and what, decimated, and what we have instead is a progressively right-wing, fanatic, settlement, pro-settlement government. This is, this, is, this is terrifying, and the fact that Prime Minister Rabin was assassinated because he spoke of peace at that moment, I, more than anything else that happened in the history of my country, at that moment I decided that I could not any longer be a partner in the crime of deception and self-deception, and I started to join every single peace group and every single peace movement that I could find. With Physicians for Human Rights, we spent time in the occupied territories creating metal pill clinics. I'm not a doctor, but I helped with admin. Um, I went with Ta'ayush to deliver water to Palestinian villages. I did Mahsam Watch, which is where we stood at the borders to see how Palestinian labor who want to cross the border are treated by 18-year-old soldiers who are brats and who would do everything possible to humiliate the Palestinians. And what we saw was settlements that are built with beautiful Swiss tiles on the roofs, red. If you've been to Israel and to the settlements, you'll see this roofs that have red tiles on them and villas with swimming pools, while right across the street you will see villages that have no access to running water and a running sewer in the middle of the road. For the efforts of those of us who participated in the peace movement, and that's where Zalman and I met, we were tear gassed, we were abused, we were condemned, we were put on watch lists, which affected, of course, my academic career in Israel. I was terrified that I would lose my job um, because of the activities that I did. Israel's, Israelis don't see this. Now, I'm not saying that all Israelis are willfully uh, evil and want an occupation, but I think a lot of them have somehow deceived themselves and don't understand what is going on. They don't see the big picture. We're hoping that with our book and maybe with more and more awareness that this situation is harmful not only for the balance of power in the Middle East, but really for the future of the Jews, should that be our concern, should that be our main concern. This is not good. This is not a good situation. Israel is turning out to be more and more a pariah state and Hopefully more and more people will understand that Israel has to negotiate in good faith for a change rather than use the word negotiation to perpetuate the status quo. And Zaman will explain why for all these years peace has not been achieved. Thank you.
Uh, as Daphne already mentioned, Israel announced that they are going to build now, after all that happened recently, 1,100 housing units in Gilom. A little bit before that, Israel fought and still is fighting tooth and nail against the recognition of the Palestinians as a, a, a state by the UN. Prior to that, uh, it refused despite the demand of the United States, not so loudly but still clearly, and the UN, uh, that they will stop building settlements. They are continuing to build settlements. They rejected Obama's position that these negotiations, the peace negotiations, will be based on the 1967 borders, uh, as if there are really borders. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of it, but Israel is probably the only country in the world that doesn't actually have borders. When we talk about the 1967 borders or any other borders, they are usually the borders of the Armistice Agreement that was signed in 1949, and they are legally boundaries and not borders. And that was at the insistence of uh, Israel, because they knew very well, as soon as you agree that these are borders, they are fixed. And then there is no more uh, easy cancelling them and expanding the territory that you control. So, uh, I'm using uh, a number of recent examples uh, of uh, uh, incidents that demonstrate, I think, quite clearly that today Israel still does not want peace. But as I said, there was nothing particularly new about that. Uh, the goal of the Zionist movement, which as you probably know, began at the, at the end of the dying years of the 19th century. The first Zionist Congress took place in Basel, Switzerland in 1897. And uh, right then, the slogan that Daphne mentioned before of uh, uh, a people without a land for a land without a people uh, began. In other words, already then, when people knew very well that there are people residing in, in, in Palestine, the, the, the slogan of the movement was, it's ours. It's ours because there is nobody there. The goal of the Zionist movement was to achieve uh, uh, sovereignty over the entire area of what we call mandatory Palestine. And that is the area between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea, the entire area that is now actually under Israeli control. Over the years, from the establishment of the Zionist movement, as I said in 1897, and onwards, there have been a number of uh, uh, suggestions, uh, initiatives, uh, and that were designed to try to settle the conflict that was intensifying. Um, nevertheless, at the end of uh, uh, World War I, when uh, Britain uh, took possession by defeating the, the Ottomans, the Turks, uh, took possession of uh, the entire Middle East, essentially, uh, the first step that the uh, British government uh, uh, did was the, 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 the famous or infamous, as you wish, of the Balfour Declaration. Uh, the Balfour, Lord James Balfour was the, the British Foreign Secretary, and he announced that His Majesty's government sees favorably the establishment in Palestine of a homeland for the Jewish people. So long as the rights of the rights and the aspirations of the local people will not be disturbed. Uh, in, in 1936, 1937, um, things really went from bad to worse. And the Peel Commission, headed by Lord Peel, uh, established for the first time uh, the proposal of partitioning Palestine into two independent states. 
the Arabs rejected it. Immediately, outright rejected it. Their argument was that this is their land. The Jews, the vast majority of the Jews, which is quite true, were newcomers who just came in mostly at that time from Europe, from Eastern Europe. And uh, they did not see any reason why they should share their uh, homeland or their land with the Jews. The Jews accepted it. This person that spoke for the Jews at the time was the person that became afterwards the uh, first Prime Minister of Israel, David Ben-Gurion. And he announced quite enthusiastically that he is all for it. Um, strangely enough, at the same time, literally within weeks, of issuing uh, this, this uh, statement that uh, Israel supports the, uh, the partition concept of the Peel Commission, he wrote a letter to his, his son Amos. The letter is today in the archives of Ben-Gurion, and he says, don't worry about it. This is just a step that we have to take. We have to agree to the partition if we wanted the support of the British government, but this is just the first step. We are going to continue. We're going to continue to achieve the Zionist dream, and we will succeed in it sooner or later. And there have been a series of, of uh, um, initiatives, and none of them uh, came into fruition because Israel did not want them. We are then going up to the 1980s when a fellow by the name of Miron Ben Benishti, the uh, ex deputy mayor of Jerusalem, was the, the deputy mayor under Teddy Kollek, uh, wrote, an, uh, he, uh, wrote an article and said there are now 80,000 settlers in the uh, occupied territories. Anybody that believes that there is in Israel a political force that can take them back is dreaming. He said, I think that the idea of two states, independent states together, is gone. And we should stop thinking about the possibility of a one-state solution. We have now 500,000 settlers. About uh, 320,000 in the actual set settlements, and about 180 to 200,000 around Jerusalem. Uh, once again, anybody who believes that there is, in the reality of Israeli politics, a force that can dismantle that project and bring them back to Israel to give the Palestinians the 22% that they settled for, I think is dreaming. The Israelis, with the encouragement and the uh, uh, support of the Americans, uh, decided that they are all for a two-state solution. And it was two states, uh, independent Palestinian state and Israeli state, and that should come to reality uh, by negotiations. In fact, the Americans when they voiced the objection of the, the petition of the Arabs, the Palestinians, to the UN, said there is a state will be achieved, the Palestinians said, will be achieved only through negotiations. I'd like to tell you that that is a cynical joke. Uh, already in 1991, after the Madrid Peace Conference, which was initiated by Bush Sr. when he was the president, uh, the, the Prime Minister of Israel then said, I'm all for negotiations. I love negotiations. So 10 years of negotiations, 20 years of negotiations, maybe 25 years, who knows? But negotiations forever. Uh, the situation today is that the Middle East is changed. The Arab Spring, and we don't know what is going to come out of the Arab Spring, but I think the one thing is clear. The Arab Spring will and is changing the Middle East significantly, permanently, and I think for the better. Uh, not, I don't have great illusions 
about a whole string of really Western democracies popping up on the scene. But I think that in terms of Israel, it is now the only hope because what it is doing is increasing Israel's isolation within the region. Israel had, before the Arab Spring, three allies in the Middle East. The main one was Turkey, the next one was Egypt, and the last one was Jordan. Israel now doesn't have any allies in the Middle East. Turkey uh, recalled its uh, ambassador. Egypt, uh, you all saw the news about the attack, the Palestinian, I'm sorry, the Egyptian attack on the embassy and the removal of the embassy staff by an Israeli uh, <coughs> military plane. And then Jordan asked Israel for the sake of security to remove the staff of the, the uh, embassy in Jordan. Israel is isolated and Israel is panicking about that isolation. And yet at the same time, the political reality within Israel is such that even if the Prime Minister, who is no uh, uh, peace angel, uh, wanted to do something, uh, he would lose his government within 24 hours because his partners in the coalition government are all to the right of him and make very clear that they will not support any uh, uh, negotiations or any move towards peace. So, on one hand, we see some hope. We see some possibility uh, through this Arab Spring and through the series of enormously large demonstrations in Israel for social justice particularly related to housing and cost of food and all of these things, the leaders of this uh, uh, movement have uh, uh, kind of very, very consistently uh, uh, avoided and objected to any uh, uh, involved, political involvement in this movement, but still, uh, when a, a, a demonstration movement like that starts, you never know where it's, go where it's going to end. So, the only thing that changed since we finished writing the book, which is about uh, a year and a half ago, is that we concluded in the book that we don't see peace coming in our lifetime. There is at least a slight possibility that what we see now happening in the Middle East will uh, produce some change. If it will, my prediction is that it will have to be in the direction of a one-state solution. I believe that the two-state solution is dead and buried. Nevertheless, hope spring eternal, and I'm not saying it cynically. I say it's, it's, it's possible, um, it's not likely. Thank you very much.